Support for Short Stops is presented by the Kalem Trading Institute. Check out our website at www.kalaminstitute.com. On today's episode, lose money in stocks once in a while. So, yeah. you know, they, they like to buy the tops and sell the bottoms, you know, not the way I would do it, but that's that's the that's the mentality that new investors have. So they, they love a stock at 40. They think it's going to the moon, as they say, or, you know, they think this is a stock that can 5x or 10x over the next five years, but then it drops 25%. And now they hate it. Yeah, <laughs> Nothing, nothing's actually changed with the business. It's just it went down. You can't like a stock that goes down, right? So over 50 technical stock indicators, a little less than 300 companies listed in the Philippine Stock Exchange, multiple ways to risk your money trading, while hundreds of emotions are passing through you as you watch prices move in the market. But we're not focusing on all of them. We're just here to talk about the ones that matter. You asked for it, so we're going to give it to you. This is Short Stops Season 2. Let's go. Hi, traders. Good evening. Um, welcome to our interview with Mr. Jonah Lupton. Uh, I think most of us are aware. Okay, Jonah is an entrepreneur, one of the most prominent growth investors also on FinTwit today. And uh, many of us have been follow. We've been actually a lot of us have been following you, and we definitely regard your opinions as valuable opportunities. So we're very fortunate that you've agreed to generously share your experiences and strategies with us tonight. Okay, so I will give the floor now to our president and CEO of Calum Trading Institute, Mr. Edmund Lee. Hi everyone. Um, personally, uh, I actually been following Jonas since last year. And he has done an exceptional job trying to help investors, traders alike, putting spotlight on not just on big companies and medium companies um, last year, but right now mostly on small companies as well, which has been fantastic. Um, because most of these companies haven't received the same amount of attention. I think even on the small cap, especially in the founders and CEOs, you've actually gained a lot of respect from their end, as seen with all the interviews you've been doing lately. Um, so Jonah, welcome to the show. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Hopefully you guys aren't the hedge funds that are shorting my stocks. That's sort of the challenge. I mean, that's that's the challenge that I have to try to deal with right now. Um, you know, I, I get I literally get messages from hedge funds messaging me on Twitter, emailing me, tweeting directly at me saying, hey, we're, we love shorting your stocks because we know that you're finding these companies and you're getting retail investors excited about them, and that's opening the door for us to short them. And like, how do, I can't I can't do anything about that. You know, I can't I can't really protect these companies. But I do believe over the long term, the fundamentals will win out. So if these guys want to short the stocks in the short term because that's the way the trend is going, that's fine. You know, I just think we have to be disciplined in our approach, and I need to do a better job of using stop losses on my own positions, probably knowing that those those shorts are coming and then, you know, get back in at better prices and, you know, hold on to these things for the next few years. Yeah. I mean, one thing that we feel that has set you apart versus everybody else is that you spent, you spend a lot of time doing due diligence and looking at companies from three to five year time horizons. And we think it's been fantastic so far. I mean, all the traders, especially in our end, always look at your research, um, several others on Twitter, and we try to make all our investing and trading decisions, I mean, somehow related to how you guys also look at some of these companies. Right. Yeah, yeah I think it's, I mean, I think due diligence is really important. Um, you know, talking to other investors that also own the stock to find out why they like it. You know, there is, there is a rationale for even talking to the investors that don't like the stock, right? you know, uh, especially if you're going to build a, you know, in my case, a significant position in the stock. You know, it probably is good for me to take a step back and think about, you know, the bearish case for a particular company. You know, I mean, we all know there's risks with every stock, but, um, you know, sometimes you can get so excited about a company that you kind of put on the blinders <laughs> and you start to ignore the red flags because you believe in the company so much. You don't want to you don't want to listen to the negativity or the bear case. But <laughs> I think I need to do a better I need to do a better job of kind of. Um, you know, looking at both sides of a, of a company yeah, or yeah. both sides of a stock and really understanding the downside, not just the upside. Yeah, definitely. I actually have questions about that later. Um, but before that, we've, uh, like, I, I've noticed that a lot of decisions that you do is mostly bottom up. 
um, in terms of looking at companies. Obviously, I, I'm not sure if this is coming from your background in Morgan Stanley and all the other wealth management firms you've been through. But how big of a factor would the overall broad market or sentiment be towards your decision making? Yeah, I mean, I've I've probably I've probably done a bad job of. So, <laughs> I mean, la- last year I was I was doing mostly large cap growth. So my portfolio was, you know, Tesla, CrowdStrike, Shopify, Zoom, Peloton. You know, all the companies that I believed would benefit from the pandemic, and I mean that was the right place to be. And then at the end of 2020, I started dumping all of those stocks. I just felt like valuations had gotten way too stretched and we needed to see a pullback, you know, some contraction on multiples. You know, when you see a stock up 300% in a year, but yet the revenues are only up 50, 60, 70%, you know, that dislocation is going to cause some pain at some point. You know, that that spread just can't continue. At some point, the, the stock price has to come down to meet the fundamentals or the fundamentals have to come up to meet the, you know, to meet the stock price, the valuation. So, you know, we're obviously seeing that that contraction on multiple right now, as we also see a deceleration in revenues, you know, not a great combination. So I think there's still more pain to go in some of these large cap stock names that just just really got overvalued last year. Now, some of them are down 40, 50, 60 percent. So, you know, we're probably getting close to close to the bottom in some of them. And then I got into small cap growth, you know, back in December, rode that up for three months and it was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, I think I was up over 120% through the first six or seven weeks of the year. And I just, I don't know if it was just greed or carelessness or, you know, just large cap, you know, growth had led for so long and large caps have beaten small caps for so long. I felt like the rotation in the small cap could last longer, but man, I mean, when that, that bubble burst and, you know, small cap, mid cap growth started deflating, um, you know, part of it was the SPACs. I mean, clearly the, 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 the number of SPACs coming to market was out of control. Crypto was taking off. And I just think there was a lot of, a lot of air coming out of that small mid cap growth space. Um, and I was on the, I was on the wrong end of it. So you know, I'm mad at myself for not having some protection on the portfolio in terms of, you know, put options on probably either IWM or IWO, you know, the two Russell indexes that I, I look at most often. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not a short guy, so I don't, I don't even want to, I don't want to short individual positions or even short indexes. I just don't think that's the best way to hedge, at least in my opinion. Um, I also should have taken more profits. Uh, you know, I didn't want to pay short term capital gains because I'm in a high tax bracket. Clearly, that was the wrong decision. And I will never, ever not sell a stock because of taxes. You know, I have I've learned my lesson that it is much, much, much better to sell a position, take a profit, pay the taxes, than watch the profits on that position just disappear and turn into a loser. I mean, you know, it sucks watching a position go from, you know, a, a, a 60, 70, 80,000 unrealized gain to a 60, 70,000 unrealized loss. I mean, that is just painful to watch happen. So I learned that lesson as well. Now, in terms of broader market, so I mean, I do watch the indexes somewhat closely. Um, I think that's been even more painful the last couple of months is watching small and mid cap growth get hammered as the SPY, you know, hits new highs and the Dow hits new highs almost every day. Like there's just been this just total dislocation between what's working and what's not working. You know, when you have value stocks hitting all time highs and growth stocks down 40, 50, 60 percent, it's just that much more painful to think about. Um, you know, I didn't rotate into some of those value stocks. I thought I thought there would be some rotation out of small mid cap growth into value. And then like we saw last year, I thought we would get a a quick rotation back, you know, after growth pulled back 20, 25%, but it didn't work out that way. I mean, the the separation between the two just kept getting wider and wider and wider. And now I think, as we say, you know, the pendulum has just swung too far in both directions. You know, value's gotten overbought and growth has gotten oversold. And I think we're going to start to see that rotation back at some point. You know, some of these value stocks, the recovery stocks that, you know, got beat up last year, 
uh, you know, oil and gas, financials, industrials, uh, cyclicals, et cetera. I mean, some of them are, you know, trading 50, 60, 70 percent higher than their pre-pandemic prices, which to me just doesn't make any sense. So um, I think at some point. So like I'm looking at it as I think, you know, people say, oh, well, what's going to happen if the Nasdaq rolls over? You know, if uh, if the S&P pulls back, isn't that going to be bad for small mid cap growth? I don't necessarily think so. I think we're still in a, a broad bull market. I think it'd be healthy. And what I'm hoping for and almost expecting is that we do see a pullback in some of the value names, the SPY. Uh, that pulls back and some of that money flows into some of these beaten down stocks and sectors. So I don't think the I don't think if the SPY pulled back 5%, it means that small cap growth has to go down 5% as well. So that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, we'll see, you know, I mean, uh, I could easily be wrong and, you know, SPY could pull back, you know, start to correct and everything else could come down too. But I, I just, I don't think that's going to happen. Not, not with some of these stocks down 50, 60, even 70%. I mean, I've seen a couple small cap growth stocks that are down 80% off of their highs. Um, just, oh God. Whew. I mean, the dot-com bubble was bad. In, I mean, I, and I wasn't managing money in the dot-com bubble. I didn't start managing money until 2002. So the end of the dot-com bubble. But, you know, I mean, I was meeting with a lot of clients at that time and they were showing me their portfolios. You know, like, let's say they had $300,000 back in 1997, you know, that 300,000 went up to like 1.5 million at the top of the bubble and then came all the way back down to 200,000, you know, after it all burst. So, you know, they, they kind of got back to where they were to start with five years earlier, but, you know, it felt pretty bad because you went up five X and then you came down, you know, by 80, 85%. So uh, I think a lot of people that, you know, just got into investing last year, that's probably how they feel. You know, they they got in near the top or they got in at the right time, rode these stocks higher, and now they've now they've seen a 50, 60, 70 percent pullback, especially if they're using margin. And even worse is if they're using, you know, call options. I mean, call options were working pretty well last year when everything was going straight up. But you know, when you're using call options, especially short dated ones, you know, time, time is your enemy. Um, you know, and and I mean, you start to see those those option contracts expire worthless, uh, and you're left with just a big zero in your account. Uh, that's that's pretty painful. So, I think there's been a lot of reality reality checks over the past couple of months. People trying to you know realizing that maybe maybe they're not as good of an investor as they thought they were. And I mean, I'll I'll admit, I mean, I've made plenty of mistakes this year too. I mean, I'm still now I'm still up for the year. Uh, I'm actually I'm up I'm. I haven't checked in the last few days because I'm almost scared to. But if I had to guess, I'd say I'm probably still up maybe 40 percent for the year, um, but down probably 60 percent from the highs. Um, and the reason I'm up is because my two biggest positions coming into this year were Upstart and Futu. And they're both up over 100 percent year to date so far. So, you know, those two stocks have really, really saved my portfolio this year, while a lot of the other small cap names have just gotten punished over the last couple months. Yeah, but I think it's super normal that you'll see investors start to come in, especially when you have 100, 200, 300 percent. I mean, that's where always the that's where always the retail start opening accounts. I mean, it's the same reason why you're happening. It's happening in cryptocurrency right now. Right. Right. Yep. They 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 love to get in when everything looks fantastic. You know, that's usually the top. And then you get a pullback and they love to sell at the bottom because everything looks bad. And, you know, if you're going to be a long term investor, you have to change that mindset. You have to be willing to go in and buy stocks when everything looks really, really, really bad. Um, and it, like it just it's painful. And see, I don't know, like I my mindset is so much different than that. Like I love big sell offs in stocks because if I'm a long term investor and I believe in the company and I've done my due diligence, then those are buying opportunities for me. So I I hate buying stocks you know, after they've had a big rally or, you know, if my portfolio is up, you know, if, if, if my top five or six stocks are up five, six, seven percent on a day and I have some new cash in my account, I'm not buying anything. You know, I, I will almost never buy a stock when it's up big for the day. So I, I like big red days for that reason. While other people are panicking, I'm more than happy to go in there and start, you know, nibbling on my favorite companies. But, but this sell off, I mean, you know, the whole buy the dip mentality has not worked out so well over the last couple of months. 
You know, we keep thinking, you know, I mean, look, you, you look at charts and, you know, last year, you know, the, the buying opportunities were, you know, add to positions on pullbacks to the 20 day. You know, this year it's like, wait until it gets to the 200 day. You know, you start loading up on the 200 day and boom, it comes crashing through the 200. And you're like, where the hell is the support for this company? And you start to like, look back and you're like, oh my God, this thing could fall another 20, 25% before there's any real support for it. So um, it's just a lot of, a lot of tough lessons learned this year. And, you know, I'll throw myself in there as well. <laughs> That's that. I mean, every, as, as beginners or as retail investors, I mean, these are very normal circumstances, right? I mean, when you start to see oh, your yeah. stock going down, you start to think, is there's maybe there's something wrong with my company? And then you tend to panic. And then, then it's time for some of these stocks start to have these sell off and it just snowballs from there. Right. Yeah. I mean, like for me, I think my, my mindset, you know, because I have pretty good cash flow, I mean, I own a bunch of different businesses, um, cash that comes in every week. I can keep buying the dip, you know, so I have no problem dollar cost averaging. For other people that are dealing with a finite amount of capital, I think they need to be more prudent about risk management and using hedges, um, you know, using stop losses and making sure that winners don't turn into losers, um, you know, whether you're short term or long term. I just think, if, you know, if you have finite capital, it's, you just you need to have a different approach to protecting the downside versus someone like me that. Yeah, the downside sucks in the short term, but you know, if I think that this company is going up five x or ten x over the next five years, I'm willing to just, to just keep dollar dollar cost averaging down, even though it's painful in the short term. You know, I'll make up for it on the long side. Yeah, I'm sure Chairman would agree with you. I mean, cash flow is always key in these scenarios. Oh yeah. Oh god, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I make good money, and literally ninety percent of my income goes right into my investment account. <laughs> I, I literally go to my bank every two days to wire money over to my account. So <laughs> just keep just keep feeding my losers. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess we should st start talking about investing strategy. Um, you mentioned that last year you made that shift from high growth. Um, you talked about Zoom, Peloton, and now you're sticking to um, small caps now because the valuation has gone up so much for some of these big caps. Yeah. Um, now that things have changed, I mean, we've seen a huge shell off, not just in the small caps, but even at the high growth, right? Um, is that something that maybe your investment strategy might change back again? And because sometimes these big cap tech growth companies are usually the first ones to rally um, during the, whenever you're seeing back rotation, back to growth. So I'm just curious yeah, what, so, what's I your mean, thoughts on that? I definitely put myself out there as a small mid cap growth guy. Um, I mean, if I'm looking at my portfolio right now, I'm actually probably less small cap and more mid cap. Um, you know, my two biggest positions are Upstart and Futu. You know, Upstart's about a seven or eight billion dollar market cap. Futu is around 17 billion. So, you know, Upstart's probably mid cap. Futu is probably large cap. You know, after that, then you start to get into the smaller positions, you know, billion dollar market caps. Um, Durham Tech is one, uh, Celsius, although that's like a $4 billion market cap. So I'm probably a little bit more mid cap growth right now. And then you start to like get into, you know, Redfin, Grow Generation, NEO. Um, so NEO and Futu are my two, my only two large caps. And then the rest are mid and small. You know, I started to get out of more of the small cap and definitely the micro cap names because I felt like I was being targeted by the short sellers. And it's a lot easier for them to manipulate the price on smaller companies with, you know, less liquidity. So I think for me, like mid cap growth is probably going to be a safer place to be, uh, especially if I'm doing my my weekly sub stack write ups and other retail investors are buying these companies. Because I think I think the shorts are, you know, feeding off of um, growth, you know, small cap growth stocks that have high retail ownership because those, you know, those retail investors like they have limited capital and they get scared out of positions easily. You know, they're the first ones to panic sell. Uh, and that's just going to keep these, these stocks uh, dropping lower when there's, when there's pressure from the short. So, so for me, like it's, you know, I'm, I'm more of a mid cap growth guy now. Um, I, so there probably are some opportunities in large cap growth. I mean, I'm going to keep like, I'm just going to keep feeding Futu and, you know, my current positions. Cause I, I still think that, 
Those are the strongest names right now in terms of fundamentals and valuation. And once growth comes back in favor, I think these are the first stocks they're going to, you know, the types of stocks that are going to lead us higher. Um, in terms of like large cap growth, I mean, there are some, there probably are some bargains in there, but there's also, I still think there's some, there's some, there's some traps, you know, there's some, because there's like a lot of these companies saw such a massive acceleration in uh, revenues last year that you're going to see, you know, you're also going to get into some much harder comps later this year. Um, you know, Peloton, Zoom, those types of companies are going to see some very hard comps this year. And I'm just afraid that the stock price is going is going to suffer once you get into those very difficult year over year comps. So I still wouldn't touch most of those companies, you know, Zoom, Peloton. Um, I still think they're probably a little overvalued. Uh, I'm trying to think like which ones I would touch. You know, I, I, I think Palantir in the mid teens is somewhat interesting. Um, but like, once again, I mean, I, I, I did a, an interview the other day and I was talking about upstart and, you know, just as a joke, sort of, I pulled up the fundamentals for Snowflake. So Snowflake is a pretty well-known enterprise software company. They came public last year at like $70, $80 billion. The thing zoomed up to like $420 a share. And it was trading at, I think, 120 times sales. 120 times sales is just insane um, for a company that, yes, they're growing fast, but they were also losing a ton of money. Um, so I know the whole rule of 40 was, you know, looked really good because growth was so high. But, you know, their, their negative, um, you know, EBITDA and net income margins were absolutely horrible. So, I mean, the company's still losing a ton of money. I get they're growing fast, but, you know, like even the stocks pulled back, I think from 420, I think it's down 60, 65% from the highs. I think it's still trading at like 50 or 60 times sales, you know, as revenues start to slow down versus upstart where revenues appear to be accelerating. I mean, they just raised their revenues from their, their guidance this year from 500 million to 600 million. They increased their Q2 numbers. They increased their, their full year numbers. Uh, contribution margin is going up. Conversion rates are going up. So Upstart is now uh, expecting at least 158% year over year growth and trading at under 13 times sales. So why would I want to buy Snowflake at 50 times sales um, with you know, growing at 120%, you know, and then that's going to start slowing down next year. I think they're expecting maybe 80%. So, I mean, like, even when you see some of these large cap growth stocks that have pulled back 50, 60% from their highs, I still think a lot of them look expensive. You know, when you start to look out, when you start to look out over the next couple of years, you know, some of them are still going to put up 40, 50, 60% growth this year. But, you know, in the next quarter or two, People are going to start looking forward to 2022. And if those revenue numbers are going from 60% this year to 40% next year, you're going to see even more multiple contraction. So I just, I don't, I mean, I, I just don't want to get in the middle of that. You know, if these multiples still have to contract more, I just, I just don't want to ride out that wave on, on some of these large cap growth stocks, unless I, unless I see something where I think, you know, revenues are going to start to accelerate again. Um, or the price has just been beaten down so far that you're going to get some sort of a, a relief rally, but then I'm more of a, a swing trader than I am a long-term investor. So um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, feel free to, you know, throw any, throw any large cap growth stocks at me and I'll let you know if I touch it or not. But I mean, and that's where I think like, you can't just, you can't paint the whole sector with a broad brush. You know, there's, there's opportunities in large cap growth. And then there's some stocks that I think have to go sideways for a while. You know, I mean, look at Tesla, you know, Tesla, I sold Tesla at the end of 2020 at $700, literally the last day of the year, um, ran up to 900. It was kind of painful to watch that happen. Now it's pulled back under 600. It's, I mean, it's kind of still expensive. Um, you know, you can love Tesla, you can love the company, the product, the CEO, whatever. It's kind of hard to love the valuation, though, um, especially knowing that more competition is coming. Um, and, you know, they're already having problems in China. And I've been saying that for the last few months that I just don't think the CCP, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is going to let Tesla come on to their their homeland and beat out their their local companies. and. I think we're starting to see that play out now. So, 
You know, I mean, I, I still think Tesla is a, you know, they make phenomenal cars and I love what they're doing for, uh, for the environment. But I mean, I still think the stock might have another 10, 15, 20% on the downside, you know, before it even looks just remotely reasonable on a valuation basis. Yeah. I mean, we were joking um, like three years ago that when you were talking about price to sales of like 20 times price to sales, like three or four years ago, most likely that would be a ridiculous valuations already. And now like late last year to early this year, we've been seeing companies like 50, 60, and that was on the average for some of these software as a service companies. I mean, like what you said, even on Snowflake, I mean, ridiculous valuations outright. I, I just, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how you can justify paying 50, 60 times sales when revenues are going to start decelerating <laughs> over the next couple of years. And I get that the, you know, the, the TAM is very, very large and these companies will grow you know, for the next five, 10 years, but you're going to see that growth rate ticking down every year, you know, going from 130 to 100 to 70 to 60 to 50 to 40, you know, and the multiples are going to contract the whole way. So, you know, I'm looking, so like the way that I approach this is, you know, like you said earlier, kind of bottom up, um, you know, I'm looking at companies that, um, you know, high growth now, but sustainable high growth and maybe even accelerating growth you know, because that's where you're going to see multiple expansion, um, but also just these companies, these very disruptive companies that in many cases are creating a new category, a new market where they are the clear leader now and going forward. So, you know, upstart, I mean, there's really nobody else out there that is doing, you know, AI underwriting on the same level as upstart. And now they've built an eight year head start. Um, with their model, collecting data. I mean, they talk about 16 billion cells of data that are basically, you know, using AI and machine learning to, you know, keep their models, you know, getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And, you know, that's why all these bank partners are coming on board. And that's why the revenues are increasing because, you know, they are, they are showing that AI is a better, faster, cheaper way to do underwriting. Um, and if the banks can increase the number of loans that they're, they're, they're giving out, uh, you know, that's essentially increasing their revenues, which is exactly what their goal is. And right now, you know, banks balance sheets are as big and as strong as they've ever been. So banks are going to be looking to do a lot of lending over the next couple of years. They don't need or want all of this cash on their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to be lending out that money and generating revenue. So like, that's a company that I believe in for the next three, four, five years. And I think this company could you know, looking out, I mean, I did a, uh, an update yesterday in my, or last night in my sub stack, you know, why I'm still bullish on Upstart, especially since it's pulled back to 84. And I mean, I think this could be a $40 billion company in, in less than five years. So, you know, I mean, so when I'm looking for companies, I'm looking for companies that I think can at least 5X over the next five years, which would be about a 38% compounded annual growth rate. So that's kind of where, where I start. So if I don't think a company can 5X over the next five years, I just don't think I want it in my portfolio. And that's why a lot of these large cap growth names just aren't attractive to me right now because, you know, CrowdStrike, Net, um, you know, Cloudflare, Peloton, Zoom, you go through the whole list, even Shopify. Like, I just don't think those companies can 5X over the next five years because their multiples are still relatively stretched based on what those, you know, sustained revenues are going to look like. So, so that's why I still think the most, you know, the best opportunities are small mid cap growth. Cause I think that's where you can find, you know, the, the most likely five baggers over the next five years. So, you know, whether it's upstart or food or derm tech or transmedics or ClearPoint, desktop metal, you know, so that's, that's my newest position in my portfolio is desktop metal. Um, you know, for anyone that's kind of followed 3D printing and, you know, now they're, con now they're calling it additive manufacturing 2.0. You know, I remember when 3D printing first came out like 15 years ago and it was ridiculous. It was like, you know, I mean, the, the, the little crap, the toys, the trinkets you were printing out, you know, I mean, they were kind of a joke. Like if anyone watches that show Big Bang Theory, there was an episode where Howard and Raj you know, bought a 3D printer and they printed out these like little dolls that were supposed to look like themselves. And they were like the, the two ugliest dolls you've ever seen in your life. You know, that was like the original 3D printing 1.0. And now, you know, that industry, the technology has progressed so far. I mean, now you can, I mean, these machines that desktop metal has, I mean, they're a hundred times faster than, you know, legacy printers. And now, 
I mean, all of these different materials from steel to copper to all sorts of different comp- carbon fiber, uh, other types right. of composites and polymers. Now they're doing wood. So, I mean, they, they, they just announced wood last week. And then this week they announced uh, they can do 3D printed dentures that are stronger than ceramic. So, I mean, it's just, just mind boggling what, you know, what 3D printing and additive manufacturing might actually do. And when you start to like, think about it, you know, how traditional parts are made for, you know, auto manufacturers, you know, the aerospace industry, you know, all of these parts are like, you know, stamped out or they're using molds. And uh, that's a very expensive, slow process to change designs. You have to do massive quantities in order to get the cost down. And 3D printing changes all of that. You know, you can do designs in software and print out one part if you want, you know, or print out thousands of parts. So, uh, you know, Desktop Metal has said that the cost of doing 3D printing now on their machines, um, up to 100,000 parts, it's now cheaper to use their machines. Once you get over 100,000 parts, then it's technically still cheaper to do, you know, the old way of, of, ma- of, of making parts. But they think that in the next few years, that'll change. And, that, you know, they think that uh, 3D printing parts, um, you'll be able to go up to about 500,000 parts and it'd still be cheaper to do 3D printing versus the old way of doing it. So like, I'm just, I'm really, I mean, there's some of the, you know, and if you look at ARC Investments, you know, they're, they're big ideas. Uh, they think 3D printing is going to be a, about $146 billion industry by the end of this decade. Right now it's about $12 billion. So that's about a 12x increase over the next nine years. And I think companies like Desktop Metal are going to lead that charge. So, you know, I think Desktop Metal, you know, you get to the end of the decade, I think this could be a 60, 70, 80 billion dollar company, you know, nine years from now. So, you know, once you find those companies, especially at these prices, I think you just got to you just got to close your eyes and buy as much as you can and then and be patient. But that's that's because I'm a longer term investor. Yeah, huge, huge. I mean, could you describe for us for a bit about your position sizing and how you normally enter, for example, like stocks that there's DM? Because before yes. you used to be a lot more diversified before, right? Now it's yep. a little bit more concentrated. Yep. So for, for whatever reason, it seems like when the market's going great, I, I get more excited about more companies and I tend to have more positions in my portfolio almost like I don't want to miss anything, you know, and, you know, I might have two stocks, you know, two cannabis stocks, two EV stocks, two cybersecurity stocks, you know, two e-commerce and, you know, kind of split it up that way. And then when the markets start to pull back and volatility starts to, to go higher, I, I tend to consolidate, you know, so I start to, tr- to sell off my lower conviction stocks, uh, consolidate into my higher conviction names. So clearly my position sizes are going to increase at that point. And so, I mean, I had over 40 positions um, back in February, and now I'm down to 12. And my top 10 positions, even my top, my top eight positions, probably account for 90% of my portfolio. So I'm definitely more concentrated now than, I've, than I have been in a long time. You know, there was a point last summer where I got very, very concentrated as well. Um, you know, there was a couple sell-offs in... Uh, like Tesla and Fastly and a couple others, you know, so I got really heavily concentrated. Um, But this is, so, I mean, like like Upstart's my biggest position and it's over 30% of my portfolio right now. So, you know, I I didn't, if now, if, if Upstart was, you know, if they reported the earnings yesterday, or two days ago, and because the stock opened, the stock, the pre-market, the stock was at 115. Uh, so it was up 26% pre-market, you know, off of the revenue guidance, um, you know, on, on the Q1 numbers. If the stock had, you know, rallied the last couple of days, like I thought it might, and gotten up to the 130, 140 range, I probably would have trimmed a little bit of my position and gotten back down to about 20%. But since the stock has pulled back over the last couple of days, you know, I sold out a couple of my, you know, or trimmed, um, you know, the bottom trimmed about 10% from the bottom four names in my portfolio and took that cash and added it to upstart on the pullback. So, you know, I, I still think this could be a $200 stock by the end of this year. I still think this could be a $300 stock by the end of next year. 
you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, there are a couple other positions in my portfolio that I think could be, you know, could three X over the next 18 months. But I mean, Upstart is still my highest conviction name right now. So if it's going to be my highest conviction name, it should definitely be my, my most overweight position. Um, but since I'm so overweight right now, I mean, if this stock went up 50% in the next month, I would definitely start to trim it back. You know, I, I need to be more prudent right now about taking profits when I can um, and then redeploying that cash into other names. Because 30% in, in your portfolio is no joke. I mean, that's a huge position. No. That is pretty big. Yeah. I mean, des desktop metal is a, uh, is a 9% position for me right now. So, you know, typical starter position for me is probably two to 3%. Um, and then if the stock pulls back from there, you know, depending on my conviction, I may or may not add to it. You know, I know some people out there are like, you know, don't, don't add to your losers. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a point where that's probably appropriate or you need to just, you know, cut them out of your portfolio, but you know, if I love a stock at 50 and it pulls back to 40 and nothing's actually changed with the underlying business or the fundamentals, you know, then I should add to it because now it's on, now it's on sale. Um, you know, and that's an opportunity for me to add to a position. So, you know, I'll add, like if a stock pulls back 20% in the short term, like I don't really consider that a loser, you know, that's just, that's just, you know, a, a, a short term pullback. Um, I'm not, even, I mean, a loser would be, I guess, if you, you know, if you've owned a stock for, more than six months or 12 months, and it just hasn't done what you thought it would do, you know, that's when I'd be more likely to, to cut a position because perhaps I was just, you know, wrong in my thesis. So what type of, I mean, how do you build that level of conviction? I mean, what type of moats are you looking for in particular companies? I mean, you talked about Upstart um, right. and Upstart has a eight year advantage in terms of AI, right? Correct. Um, but it's still like, what's, but most of it's like customer base is pretty concentrated now with the smaller banks, right? So yeah, I mean, I mean what, what's, yeah, I mean, what's yeah? I mean, they're yeah, definitely diverse. They're definitely diversifying. You know, they're bringing on more bank partners. They've expanded from personal lending into auto lending. So I'm not I'm not too worried about the concentration risk at Upstart. I mean, like you said, you know, for them, their competitive advantages or their moat is you know the eight year head start. Um, you know, the fact that like the other big banks are not going to develop their own AI to the same degree that Upstart has. It just wouldn't be worth it. Um, they would be more likely to just use Upstart's model. Um, so, I mean, the other big banks and fintechs probably aren't really a big threat to Upstart. It would be someone like a Google probably, you know, trying to develop their own um, AI models. Um, you know, if you look at like Dermtech, you know, Dermtech's another one of my favorite companies. Uh, they reported some some decent earnings last night uh, and had some very strong comments to say about um, some of the insurance companies that they're talking to to get more uh, coverage for their their genomics patches to detect skin cancer. Um, you know that market cap is under a billion dollars now. It's around like eight hundred and fifty million, and then you back out the cash, and you know you're like six hundred million enterprise value for Dermtech right now. You know on smaller companies like you're, you're not going to see as strong of moats. You know, they just they just haven't been around. But like, so I'll, I'll skip around a little bit. Desktop Metal, for instance, has a massive um, intellectual property portfolio. So an IP portfolio, patents, they have over 200 patents filed or uh, granted. So granted, issued. So like that's one of the that's one of the moats for Desktop Metal is, you know, phenomenal management team, phenomenal board of directors, some of their st strategic investors that were actually early investors in the company are Ford, BMW, GE, Coke Industries, right? I mean, like these are all the types of companies that are going to be customers as well. So when you see potential customers investing in a company, that's a pretty good sign that they believe in the technology and where that, you know, where that industry is going to be going over the long term. Um, so like, desk, you know, so management, board of directors, strategic investors, the IP portfolio, you know, the best, fastest machines, the most diversified portfolio in terms of materials. So like desktop metal clearly has a, you know, a pretty decent moat. Now there are, there is competition out there. I mean, there's companies like Shapeways and Mark Forge and a few others, but I still think desktop metal has the best chance to be the leader in that category. Um, and you know, back to, back to Durham Tech. You know, could could another company come around and develop the same sort of patch that Dermtech has? Yeah, they could. Um, you know, 
Dermtech does have some IP out there. They do have some, some file of patents, but you can't patent someone's skin or genes or, you know, genetic makeup or anything. So, you know, they are somewhat limited as to how much you can actually protect. Um, but I think, you know, that's why it's so important to get an, a strong head start on any other potential competitors, you know, come public, you know, so Dermtech came public uh, about a year and a half ago through a SPAC. Um, you know, so now they have some cash to go out there and grow this company, you know, build the sales team, you know, develop more products. They talked about this yesterday on the earnings call. You know, they have a couple more products in the pipeline that are coming out later this year, next year. So, you know, I mean, with, with smaller caps, I think you're going to see weaker moats than you will with larger caps. You know, I mean, like, look at, I mean, any of these large, you know, whether it's, I mean, Tesla, I guess you could argue, I mean, I think even Tesla has a, has a decent moat around them, but you know, you look at like some of these other large caps, I mean, Peloton, um, you know, CrowdStrike, um, you know, what are some other ones? I mean, they all have, you know, Roku and Pinterest and all of them. I mean, then you go down to like the fangs, right? I mean, you know, Netflix, Microsoft, I mean, they all sort of have competitive, you know, moats around them. Although, they're all they're all operating in very competitive large markets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not like any of them own the market to themselves. Um, so in some ways, like these small caps that create a new category for themselves, I think they almost do own their own market for now. Um, you know, Upstart really is kind of like operating their own little category. Durham Tech is operating in their own little category. Now, I don't know how that I don't know how long that's going to last for. But I think that's that's where the huge growth is going to come from. Like Dermtech, yeah. If you look at Dermtech right now on a trailing, you know, uh, last twelve months price to sales multiple, yeah, of course it looks expensive. But if this company uh, is able to three x their revenues this year, next year, and the year after, which I think is possible, then now this stock looks pretty cheap. So, like that's the mindset that I try to have is looking out the next two to three years where I think this company can go and wanting to get in early rather than chase it, you know, chase it higher at a later point. So like Dermtech, ClearPoint, Desktop Metal, like, yeah, if you look at the price to sales multiples today on trailing revenues, yes, they looked expensive. But if these companies do what I think they're going to do over the next few years, people will regret not getting in early. Okay. Um, I'll probably have one last question before I open up to everybody else. Um, you mentioned a while ago about during these sell-offs, you'd probably think about maybe buying puts. Um, have you figured that out? Like, are you going to plan to like sell calls? I mean, at, yeah, I mean, at this point, it's too late. Um, you know, like I joked around yesterday, you don't buy insurance for your house after it's already burned down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're supposed to buy insurance while, it, you know, while it's still standing. So you know, I should have bought some put options on either my individual positions or, you know, one of the indexes, um, you know, IWO is the one that I usually use, you know, that's the Russell 2000 growth. That's probably the closest, um, you know, to my portfolio. IWM um, is the Russell 2000, you know, ARKK, you know, you can buy put options on uh, the ARK ETFs. So, you know, there would have been a few ways to hedge my portfolio to buy some insurance. Um, I didn't do it. And I regret that. And I will always kick myself for not doing that. Um, you know, or I could have just taken taken more profit. So uh, at this point, you know, with my portfolio down 50% from the highs, uh, I, I'm not going to waste, I don't feel like I want to waste money on insurance right now. It's just, I've already suffered the pain. I've absorbed the pullback. I've dollar cost average down, you know, consolidated my portfolio. So I'm I'm ready for the bounce whenever we get it. But I'm 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 full in right now. No, no hedges, no options, no protection. I do have some call options on a few positions, you know, expiring in June. So those uh we'll see what those look like. A couple of them are are actually they're all underwater right now, but we'll see. Still got five weeks for that to play out. Yeah, because I watched some of uh, your interview with Richard Moglin, right? Um, you talked about how you're also having selling tranches. Like, for example, like it hits the higher end of the Bollinger Band for your, yourself, right? You're always selling on that end. Um, right. On the reverse, um, no stop losses, no nothing. I mean, because I assume you have high conviction in most of these companies. Right? Yeah, yep. I mean, that 
that that was another mistake I made this year was just not having those stop losses in place. Um, something I should have done back in February or at least March. Um, you know, I was I was fully expecting a twenty to twenty five percent pullback. Um, you know, that's what I thought we would get in the growth names, and a twenty percent pullback for me at the time wasn't enough for me to justify selling my positions and paying the taxes, you know, the short-term capital gains. Um, clearly that, that was a mistake, you know, I, but here, here's the other problem. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain this and I'm not sure how many people will actually understand it, but I'll try, you know, I run a Substack newsletter with thousands and thousands of people that read it every week. I have a stock twits room with thousands and thousands of people. So I'm doing write-ups on stocks that I'm bullish on. And I say that I'm bullish, you know, for the next few years, you know, all of the stocks that I write about, I think have the potential to be five baggers over the next five years, right? 38% compounded annual growth rate. And then I, I post a lot of my trades in my stock twits room, you know, because I try to be transparent and help other retail investors. So if I have a, let's just say a hundred thousand dollar position in Dermtech. And, you know, I wrote about the company when it was a $38, $39 stock. And over the following four or five weeks, that stock went up to 84. Do I start to trim it? And do I tell people, right? And I really like, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the kind of guy that's going to trim something and not tell the people that I promise to tell. You know, if people are paying for my trades and I'm doing stuff and not telling them, then I feel like I'm, I'm being dishonest and that's just not who I am. So if a stock goes up by 100% and I just wrote about it four weeks ago, if I start trimming it, is that the prudent thing to do? Yes, it is. Is that going against what I said in my newsletter about how I'm a long-term investor? Maybe, you know, and then what happens if I trim it? I tell people in my stock twits room, and I know there's some pretty big funds in there. And then, you know, people start posting, you know, the fact that I sold Dermtech. And now there's a sell off in Dermtech because I started trimming it, you know. And then all the people that bought into Dermtech because they believe in the long term, you know, potential are pissed at me because I started trimming it when I just wrote about it three or four weeks ago. So it's like, I, I kind of felt like I was in like, just a no-win situation in February where I knew I should start trimming my positions and taking profits, but then it sort of went against everything that I was saying to my, my Substack subscribers. And then like, and then how do I do it and not tell people my stock twits room? So then they all start selling the stock and like, and now the stock, you know, then the stock, start, the stock starts to drop 15, 20%. And the people that just read it in my newsletter are like, what the fuck? You just wrote about it. Why are you selling it now? So like, it just, I was in a really tough position, you know, I mean, um, and I, I, I don't know if I handled it correctly. I mean, I really kind of held on to all of these stocks with very, very minimal trimming. Um, so even though I didn't do what I wanted to do, there was a reason behind it. Like I was trying to be, I, you know, stick to my word, you know, if I'm in these, if I believe in this company for the next five years, then, then I shouldn't be trimming it four weeks from now, just because all of my Substack readers have bought it and pushed it higher. And that's probably why, you know, I, I know Dermtech went up because of me, you know, there was no one else out there that was talking or writing about this company. So, I mean, I pushed that stock up hundred percent. So I, uh, then I also felt like, you know, I don't know what the SEC rules are about guys like me, you know, I mean, if I actually, if I wrote about a company in January, the stock goes up hundred percent and I start selling my shares like, am I going to get a knock on, you know, is the SEC going to show up my door, you know, asking to see all my trades? I don't know. Like, I honestly have no idea. And I didn't want to even be in that position. So I felt like I had to hold my stock just to be like, you know, transparent. Yeah. And to be transparent and not break a rule that I don't even know if it exists or not. So like when people ask why I didn't take more profits um, in February, that's why. But that doesn't excuse me for not buying put options because that's what I could have done, right? I didn't have to sell any of my positions, yeah, but I could have yeah. bought protection for them. So shame on me for, you know, like 
kudos to me for having integrity. Shame on me for not protecting the downside, you know, because there would, I mean, there would, there would be nothing wrong with that. You know, if, if Dermtech wants to go to 84 and I know that's overvalued, shame on me for not, you know, buying some, some put options when it got that extended. So, you know, live, live and learn. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, I mean, we really appreciate the integrity and the transparency from every everything that you write. And you can tell as compared to the other people who just like are long gone away from Twitter, they don't post their portfolios anymore. Right. <laughs> and I, and I, I don't post. So, I mean, I did post my portfolio on Google sheets and it was pinned to my Twitter account for about six months, but I know for a fact that the shorts were coming after my specific positions because they would literally message me. I mean, they would send me D- DMs and tweet at me bragging about shorting my stocks. So, you know, I, I had to take down the portfolio. I mean, it wasn't, it's not fair to me. It's not fair to my subscribers. It's not fair to the companies and the employees at these companies that are getting, you know, caught up in these, uh, you know, these shorts. I mean, and, and that's why, like, I, I get, I get why shorting should be legal. Um, but it just feels like right now there's a lot of coordinated attacks from the hedge funds. I mean, it's pretty clear that they're also coming after Kathy Woods and her companies, um, you know, and they're trying to create as much destruction <laughs> as possible and forced selling um, in Kathy Woods stocks. So it sucks. You know, I mean, I love Kathy. I love ARC. I love their approach and their investment strategy and, you know, how they think about investing over the long term. But like once these hedge funds with a lot of capital and a lot of leverage decide to come after your companies, it is it is very tough to withstand that. Now, you know, she doesn't have a choice. I mean, she has to stay invested in her ETF. So she really can't do anything to protect herself. She just has to let, you know, let this play out. You know, I could have protected myself. I could have, you know, bought protection and hedged better. So I, I, I could have just sold positions as well. You know, I could, you know, when a short report comes out, even though I know 90% of it is lies, it still, you know, beats the heck out of the stock. So, you know, like sometimes you just have to say, you know what, the shorts win now and I'll come back later when the, you know, the coast is clear. <laughs> okay. Let's open up to the public, Eleanor. Okay. I think Lawrence has a question. Yeah, uh, just a question about uh, technical analysis. Does it play a role in any of your decision making? Because you were talking about Bollinger Bands earlier, right? But does that actually matter? So last year it did. <laughs> uh, last year I was using the Bollinger Bands as a, a good guide on when to start trimming positions uh, as they got overextended. You know, this year, um, yeah, I was using Bollinger Bands to do some trimming back in January and February, but. <laughs> Clearly, my positions, my stocks are not overextended right now, um, at least not to the upside. So, uh, you know, if, if we get back, you know, if if my stocks, you know, start to find some love here and, you know, get back into an uptrend, yeah, then I'll probably get back to uh, using those Bollinger Bands to help guide me uh, and trim on the upside. You know, I've just been buying the dip. You know, I really haven't, you know, I've been trying to use technicals to, uh, identify potential, you know, support levels on my stocks. Um, you know, I mean, I, so I use obviously the moving averages, just like everybody else, you know, the, the 10, the 20, the 50, the hundred, the 200, um, you know, uh, SMA. I mean, and I really haven't found which one I like the most, you know, SMA, EMA, WMA. Um, I, I kind of all, I use all three of them at different times. Um, and then I also look at, you know, other indicators like the, vo- you know, volume shelves and whatnot. So I use TrendSpider a lot for my technical analysis and they have some pretty good stuff in there. You know, volume shelf will sometimes tell you, you know, where there might be support for a stock or, you know, where there's really just no, you know, you, you see kind of, you see a gap in buying. So, um, you know, if, if, if there's, if, you know, like if a stock is sitting between, you know, two volume shelves. Uh, there just may not be any support there because everyone's either, uh, you know, everyone's cost basis is either much higher or much lower than that. Um, but that's not like, I don't really base my decisions on that. It's just one more thing that I look at. But I mean, for me, like, you know, in my experience, you know, 50 day, 100 day, 200 day moving averages have always been decent times to buy. Um, it's just, I was looking at all my charts yesterday. So I, I think I 
forget where I posted this, maybe on Twitter last night. So of the of the 12 stocks that I own, you know, one stock is sitting on the 50-day moving average. One stock is sitting on the 100-day moving average. Um, uh, let's see. What is that? 10, five, five stocks are basically sitting on the 200 or one of the 200-day moving averages. And five stocks are below the 200. So, you know, if you look at charts for like Atarian, Neo, Redfin, I mean, those charts are freaking ugly. Like, I don't even know where the hell you find support on these companies. Um, and then there's a few other stocks that are like, I mean, right sitting on one of the 200-day moving averages. Uh, and these are, you know, most, most, most of them are companies that either just reported very good earnings in the last few days or have earnings coming up next week. So I think the combination of, you know, pulling back to the 200-day plus really strong earnings will end up being a nice support level for that stock, you know, when we look back in the next couple months. But, you know, like there's, I mean, when stocks break that 200-day, I mean, you know, now you're going back four, six, eight months to try to find a support level for that stock, you know, like on, forget which one I was looking at yesterday, I think it was Redfin. Um, you know, Redfin was obviously a, a phenomenal stock last year. Um, you know, so you saw massive stock appreciation, you know, you obviously saw a lot of revenue acceleration as well, but, you know, now you're getting that, that pretty significant multiple contraction. You know, I got, I got, I jumped into Redfin with a 1% position a week ago, right before they reported earnings, numbers look good, but the stock sold off. I got stopped out of it. So, you know, I actually had a stop loss on, uh, jumped back in a week later, hoping to play the bounce. You know, you got that fake two day rally and then boom, it dropped again. So, you know, now I'm I'm still holding the stock with like a cost basis in the low 50s. But, you know, you look at the chart and that thing could easily fall another 20 percent, may not find support until it gets down into the 40 range. So. So I, I try to use technical analysis, but it really hasn't helped me out much this year. You know, it's it's these uh, <laughs> these stocks just have not found support for the last two, two and a half months. Nice. Do you, do you actually spend time looking at the uh, commodities and whatnot? And because uh, those are in play today, right? Is that is that something that you ever look at? No, or mostly no, just unfortunately, unfortunately. You know, I mean i I should have been I should have recognized how well commodities would do in the face of inflation, um, and I should have had some exposure to either the commodities themselves or the companies that. You know, mine the com you know, mine the commodities, you know, take them out of the ground. So, you know, whether, you know, Freeport MacMoran or, you know, one of those companies. And then even like housing, you know, I didn't have any exposure to housing. Um, I did a I had some exposure last year, a little bit last summer. I owned a couple of the home builders. I even owned that that three X leveraged home builder ETF called uh, ticker symbol nail N A I L. Yep. I owned that for a little while, made some good money on it. I looked at it a couple of days ago on the charts and like that thing has just been an absolute rocket ship for the last, yeah. you know, six months. Um, it's just like, you know, right now, I, I just, you know, I think, I think lumber is starting to roll over. So, I mean, the question is, you know, if these commodities start to roll over, you know, you could see them pull back, you know, 20, 30, 40% pretty easily. I, I just, I feel like I've already missed it. I feel like I missed commodities. Right. I missed housing. You know, I missed a lot of these recent trades that have gone very well. I missed crypto. I missed Dogecoin. Like, you know, I just. I'm, Are you I'm okay missing those? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> I, I will. I will. I won't be a crypto guy ever. Um, I, I need I need a company with real products, real revenues, real earnings. So I can actually do some fundamental analysis with crypto, at least for me. It's just. It's supply and demand, it's momentum, it's what is Elon Musk tweeting about today? Like, that's not <laughs> how I want to manage my, my hard-earned capital. So, yeah, I just, I don't see myself ever being a, uh, a crypto guy. You know, I think if, like Ethereum probably looks the most interesting to me because I think it might have the most use cases use in case. the future. But once again, I mean, you look at the chart and that thing is just ripped so, so far, so fast. I just can't get in, you know, and, but if I did like, so I didn't use a lot of stop losses on my positions this year, because those are really longer term positions, core holdings. 
if I get into a stock that's already rallied, where I think it might be a shorter term position, I will use stop losses. So like, you know, Redfin, I use the stop loss. So, you know, because if a stock is already rally and I think it might rally another 30% or it might pull back and I really just have no idea and it's not a long-term position that I plan on keep adding to, then I will use a stop loss. You know, typically like, so with Redfin, um, you know, if it's if it looks like it's going to pull back to the 50 day, you know, and so let's just say, let's just say Redfin's trading at 70 and the 50 day is at 65 and they're going into earnings. So, you know, great report. If you get a great report with great price action, you know, it goes to 75, 80. If you get, you know, bad price action and it pulls back to the 50 day, I'll usually set my stop loss, maybe three or 4% below the 50 day. So if it breaks it, I'm out. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's how I use stop losses around moving averages and then catalysts. So I'll usually set up the stop loss rate below the moving average. So if you do break it, I'm out. And that way I don't have to worry about holding on until it gets to the next support level, you know, because yep. clearly we've seen a lot of these things break the 50, break the hundred, and then, you know, half the time they're breaking the 200 too. So. Nice. Okay. Uh, do, does the, uh, yeah, last question. Does, uh, do, do the earnings reports are, are they more, is, is more, what's more important in terms of decision making when you when you want to change uh, uh, perspective? It's really the earnings reports. How many earnings reports would you give in like leeway? Let's say if they promise something over the next quarter or two, and they can't fulfill it, is it the, is that the time that you change your opinion of a stock, or or is it um, price yeah. price oriented? Yeah, I mean it's a little bit of both. Um, like if I'm if I'm so I can say earnings don't matter. But I mean, at the end of the day, they obviously drive stock prices pretty dramatically, you know, especially on smaller names. You know, a lot of these smaller cap names are moving 5, 10, 15 percent off of earnings one way or the other. So um, like earnings, I do think earnings matter more with small caps to make sure that the story is intact, that your thesis was correct, that the company is executing well. You know, when you get into like large caps like Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, I mean, when you have 40 analysts covering a company, you know, like the, they're, they're usually pretty correct with the numbers. I mean, obviously, companies sometimes beat on revenues by 4% or beat on EPS by 3%. But like you don't get really, really big, um, you know, beats or misses with the large caps, you know, at least the mega caps. You get into small caps where sometimes you only have two or three analysts covering a company. And, you know, these companies like look at Upstart. I mean, Upstart just, you know, increased their Q2 <clears> guidance <throat> from 117 to 155, raised their, um, you know, uh, full year guidance from 500 to 600. You don't see those sorts of um, beats and raises from large caps. So I do think earnings are, I think earnings reports are more important for small caps than large caps. Um, but like, you know, let's just say Upstart, you know, if I'm really bullish on Upstart for the, la for the next five years, um, if they had come out and raised Q2 guidance by 5% and full year guidance by 10%, like I'd still be just as bullish on the company for the next three to five years. Although I may not have added to my position as aggressively as I did over the last two days on the pullback. So you know, getting to see those earnings and how phenomenal they were gave me the conviction to add to the stock on the pullback the last couple of days. Um, you know, I mean, I, I try to, so for all of my companies, I mean, thankfully I have access to management whenever I want it. So, I mean, I can email the CEOs and usually get them on the phone within 24 hours. Um, same with, you know, obviously same with investor relations. And I mean, most of these companies I've talked to the CEOs, the CFOs, in some cases, I've talked to like head of sales, head of product development. You know, I think the, the last question, I think it's a, it is a good one, though, because like a company like Intrusion. So Intrusion is a small cap cybersecurity company that I found about a month and a half ago, started a position. It's kind of a turnaround story because the company was a uh, they did mostly consulting work for the DOD, Dep Department of Defense, for 30 years. And then the founder died. So they brought in the news. Yeah, I know. I mean, he was he was much, much, much older. I think he was in his eighties. Um, but 
Then they brought in a new CEO, this guy, Jack Blunt, who's kind of a turnaround specialist, 40 years in the cybersecurity industry. And he looked at all of the technology and the software they, that they developed for the DoD and decided to package it all together and create this new enterprise product called Shield and then sell that to large companies and SMBs. So, I mean, this is sort of a turnaround story. You know, they've launched this new product called Shield in the last few months. They said they actually did a press release uh, a few weeks ago saying that they had 50,000 seats already signed up for Shield. Um, the problem is that we found out after that report that those 50,000 seats are not activated yet, you know, and that, you know, when these companies buy these seats, you know, it's, it's a longer term contract, but they have up to, I think, 12 months to actually activate them, you know, which is when they start paying for them. So, you know, I got hammered. The stock is down 50 percent. But I mean, I bought the stock because I knew it was a turnaround with a new product launch just because the stock is down 50 percent. Nothing's actually changed with the story. Um, so that's where I've been pretty public saying, I'm willing to give them another two to three quarters okay. to see if they can deliver on their promises. So I interviewed the CEO last week and he says he thinks they can get to 200,000 seats by the end of this year. He said 30 million in revenue. I don't think they're going to get the 30 million in revenue. Um, but I mean, those are his words. So let's see, like he's, he's on the record now of, you know, giving these expectations and these goals now let's see if they can actually execute. Let's see if they can actually hit those targets. Because if they do hit the targets and they do get to 200,000 seats by the end of this year, then I think Intrusion is a $30 stock. You know, right now it's trading at under 10. So, Sorry. you know, but if, if they don't hit those numbers and it turns out that the, this product really isn't as good as they've said it is, and these customers, you know, this pipeline is not as real as they said it is, then the stock probably stays under 10. So, you know, or probably goes down to five or six. So I think, you know, over the next, let's say seven months, I think the upside is, is three X. I think the downside is probably 50%, you know, and I, I, I like, I like those odds right now, but we'll see. I mean, the company has a lot to, a lot to make up oh, for, yeah. you know, they, they sort of misled us with their words in the press release and then kind of backtracked a, a couple of weeks later on the earnings call. So I feel like I sort of got misled a little bit, but we'll see, you know, if they can come through with the numbers that they said they can, you know, the stock will, you know, I'll recover my losses plus some. So, you know, that's where I think earnings is really important because it gives you a, you know, a quarterly checkup on the company. How are things going? Are they meeting their promises? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, if I was invested in like Facebook, Microsoft and the fangs, I don't know if I'd even listen to the earnings calls, to be honest. But when you're invested in small and mid cap growth stocks, like I think it's absolutely critical that you listen to the earnings calls probably twice. So I usually listen to them at least once or twice. And then I read the transcript just to make sure that I didn't, I didn't miss anything. Nice. Uh, Thank you. Jonah. Yeah. Jonah. Uh, with your concentrated uh, position, like Upstart or uh, or uh, Futu or Neo, uh, do you sell? Because since you're a long-term investor and it's concentrated, do you sell some calls out of the money calls for short-term calls just to be able to no. get the premium for cash flows? I haven't before. No, nope. Uh, it's pro I mean, obviously, it's something I should have done a couple months ago, but you know, I feel like they've already gotten beaten down so bad that I'm afraid a big bounce higher. Uh, you know, might <laughs> might force me to to give those shares up to someone else, which I wouldn't want to do. So, I mean, because when you're selling call options, I mean, you're you're capping your upside, correct? Of course, of course. Yes. Yeah. So I don't I don't I don't want to cap my upside. I want to I want to limit my downside. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, that that is a valid strategy. You know, especially when your stocks are overextended. You know, yes, that's, yes. that's the ideal time probably to sell some call options if if other people are crazy enough to buy them. Um, I'm not sure I want to sell call options after my stocks have dropped 50, 60%. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank I you. mean, like, like Der take DermTech, for instance. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, uh, a news alert that Cigna was going to be covering the DermTech patch. The stock was up 30% pre-market on that news. Um you know, I mean, and then it turned out that the report was sort of incorrect. So the stock pulled all the way back. But 
you know, some of these small cap names can move so fast on big, big news reports. I just, I just don't want to miss that upside. Okay. So um, we're going to wrap up it a little bit, but just really quickly, Jonah, because we know how Twitter can be like a huge, massive amount of noise and everything, but to be fair, (laughs) yeah, that's the word for it. But uh, to be fair to Twitter, that's how we found you. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, I mean, is there, are there any um, other individuals who you think are worth really following and listening to on, on, on the site? So I, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of great people to follow. I mean, I think it depends on what kind of investor you are. I mean, there's obviously like, there's the growth investors, there's the value investors, there's the guys that are long only, there's the long short guys, there's the you know, big picture, broad market, macro guys. There's the, you know, the really hardcore research guys and and girls. There's the, you know, there's the buy and hold people. There's the swing traders. There's the day traders. So like, it really depends on what kind of investor you are. I mean, maybe you're not even sure what kind of investor you are and you want exposure to all of these different people and strategies. Um, There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I tend to follow the, you know, the growth investors, of course, um, especially the guys that are the people that are investing in my company specifically. So, you know, if I see someone, you know, that's doing a lot of threads or updates on some of my favorite stocks, I, I want to follow them because I want to see those updates and I want to, you know, hear why they're bullish and why they like a company and what they, what they heard from the earnings call that I may not have heard. So um, I, I think I might need to do a better job of listening to the other side. You know, maybe if I was following more value managers the past six months, I would have uh, been more likely to jump into some value companies, you know, earlier this year rather than staying all growth. So, you know, but, but then like the problem is you follow the value guys and then they spend half their time talking shit about the growth guys. So, you know, there's like this war between value and growth. And like at some point, we feel you know, that like we really feel yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to follow the value value guys because you want to know what they're buying and what they like. Exactly. But when they're spending half the time, you know, talking trash about you and your companies, you kind of you end up unfollowing them. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, the reason why I'm, that's exactly the reason why I'm asking, because it can get really confusing for us. And so, you know, I mean, that, that, that's something that we I wanted to get your perspective on. Yep. And now, no, now a lot of the value guys, you know, not only are they bragging about how well their stocks are doing, they're bragging about how bad growth stocks are doing and then bragging about shorting the growth stocks, you know? So I, I, I spend less time. Like I, I look, I don't know. I still like Twitter, but it's become a lot less enjoyable the last couple of months. You know, people, people become, quite bitchy when, you know, the markets are, are going lower, or at least their stocks are going lower. And, you know, they're typically looking for someone to blame for their losses. They don't want to be accountable for bad yes. decisions. They, they want to point the finger at someone else. And I've been a pretty easy target the past month or two, you know, especially if some of my companies that I've been writing about were down, you know, even though I've, I've been pretty vocal and transparent about why I own these stocks and why I like them for the long term. It's just amazing how many people bought a stock in January or February at, you know, 30 or 40. The stock went up to 60 or 70. They didn't sell any or trim any because I didn't tell them to. And then the stock came all the way down and now it's a losing position. And, you know, they hate me and they want me to jump off a roof or jump in front of a bus. And I'm like, you guys are out of your freaking minds. Like, I mean, those are the people that probably should not be managing their own money. You know, yes. let's be honest. Like yes. they should give their money to a professional money manager or put it in an index fund because they just don't have the, the mindset and their temperament to really do this themselves. So don't worry. It's a market. It's cyclical. You're going to have your day again. You oh, know, yeah. it's going oh, yeah. <laughs> to come. I mean, like, so you don't have to worry. The, the fact that I'm still up, I think 30 or 30 or 40% for the year, you know, and my stocks have pulled back 50, 60%. I like that. I would rather be in that position yeah. than up 30% with all of my stocks at all time highs. Yes. Right. Yes. So I'd rather be up with all my stocks down than up with all my stocks at highs. So That's right. I think I'm in a good position right now to, you know, finish the year strong. I, I would expect most of my stocks to be up 
30, 40, 50 percent, you know, from now until the end of the year. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, this this market is very unpredictable and, and bipolar most days. So, you know, it seems like anytime you get a little bit of a, a bounce or a rally, you know, the profit taking comes in comes pretty in. quick. So um, it's it's been tough. It's been a very tough market to navigate the, the last couple of months. But I think we've all become better investors because of it. And I'm sure it's nothing that you haven't been through before. So oh, yeah. uh, no, I mean, not, not like this. This, this is this has been the most severe drawdown I've ever seen, and okay. it just it happened so fast. You know, it not it wasn't like the financial crisis where it was just you know back in like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, yes. where you just kind of kept you kept grinding lower and lower. This was just like a freaking you know falling off a cliff, or that, that's what it felt like. <laughs> okay, I think All only right. Brian's been through it. Brian was trading already with us during the financial during the tech bubble, so. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I missed the tech bubble. Thank God that that must have been brutal too. <laughs> okay, well, um, I really, really want to thank you, Jonah, for 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 everything because I'll tell you, you are one of the very few people who actually would be man enough to own up and admit his mistakes <laughs> and never oh, yeah. hide away from him. Because I tell you, in our industry, in our industry, that is rare. Oh yeah. <laughs> Usually, oh, yeah. when people make mistakes. They just keep quiet. <laughs> but in I mean, your situation, <laughs> you have always been I mean, very sometimes vocal. sometimes you just have to know when. I mean, first of all, the, the market, I mean, if you get cocky, the market will humble you very quickly. Absolutely. Um, yes. but it's also like sometimes you have to be stubborn, like you have to know when to be stubborn, have your conviction. Um, and then other times you just yeah, you need to admit that you were wrong and make changes or fix the problems or, uh, you know, tweak your strategy, whatever it is. Um, and I've, you know, I, I still, I still like what I'm doing. I still like small mid cap growth. Um, but yeah, this is, I mean, I, I've made plenty of mistakes and, um, you know, I feel bad that people have lost money on some of my, you know, my favorite stocks, but I still own them. You know, I'm a bag holder, if you want to call me that. And, you know, my, but nothing's changed with the companies. You know, just because the stock is down 20, 30 percent doesn't change, doesn't change the long term potential of these companies. So that's why I just, you know, I don't I don't stress about it too much. You know, this is just this is part of the process. Look, that's you know, it. look over the last yeah. 20 years, some of the best performing stocks over the last 20 years, Amazon, Netflix, NVIDIA, Exact Sciences, Monster, they all had 50 percent pullbacks or more. Yeah. So it's just it's part of the process. You know, if you don't everybody wants the big gains without the big pullbacks. And it's, it's very hard to have one without the other. We, we really appreciate more than anything, the integrity, seriously, we really do, because that's really important. I mean, it, like I said, things are rare. So to see that is, is refreshing for us also. So we really appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonah. The, the, the amount it. of wisdom and uh, that you shared with us is really <laughs> valuable to us. Thank you. And thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so Edmund. much. Care, guys. <laughs> thank right. you guys. Thank you. So traders get ready. The market's coming up. So, okay. We'll see you guys. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good, night. Bye. Good morning. Good Have a good day. Good.